Warning, the following podcast may occasionally contain strong language and material that is not suitable for all ages. If you are easily offended, it is highly advised that you turn back now. However, if you're a degenerate, welcome, brethren, you've found your home. Diner, where we share eats and treats while spilling the deets. We're the podcast formerly known as Wine, Dine, and Storytime. I'll say that for the whole year, I think. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so we changed our name. There. We did it. it. Yeah, we did it. If you're just joining us, we're a podcast that covers stories of true crime, mysteries, and just anything that we are interested in that's right at the moment we do this within a dinner with friends theme i'm nidia i'm dana and i'm cindy so it's yet another episode of the crime diner yes. here we are so excited i don't i lost count i don't know which one this is four four yeah are they going in order yeah i think <laughs> <Okay>. so because <Yeah. laughs> if they're not we just shot ourselves in the foot no it's fine okay so last week i told a very disturbing story yes you did um and i chose it because The woman that I featured, serial killer, will be released this year. Totally insane. Totally insane. I keep forgetting that. She's being released this year. And her accomplice, her ex-husband, well, her husband, I don't Mm. know if they're probably still married. Who knows? Yeah. He got released in 2016. He did like no time at all. He did like 15 years, if that. That's so scary. And she's getting out. She was sentenced to 22 years and she's actually doing... Um, she did, uh, what, 18? She got out on good behavior. Fuck you. The the good, the good bad behavior that put her in there should have kept her ass in there the 22 years, yeah, which was not enough. The scary thing about her, too, is that, like, she wasn't really even the one that was inflicting the violence on the people. So she, like, manipulated other people to do it. It's like a Charlie Manson situation where, like... Absolutely. You know, she has the capability well into her old age to manipulate other people to do this absolutely so it's like who the fuck is going to be monitoring right this, her you know? brain didn't her brain didn't yeah nothing you know, changed die. for her yeah so if you didn't catch that story it was um michelle Notek that i covered last week yeah. uh but that deals with extreme torture and um child abuse and things of that nature so if you don't enjoy those things not that i do but if you're not even a little bit interested in those things maybe skip that episode because yeah. you know or And don't come at me. Don't come at me to shame me. I already came at her. Don't worry about it. Dana already did enough of that. (laughs) It's like we just met. Okay. (laughs) It's so true. I keep being surprised by you. Well. You keep it fresh. I am not, like I said, I am interested in those things because I am interested in all dark things, but Mm. I don't watch, you know what? I I don't like gore. I don't like gory movies. I don't like scary movies like that. You're like a walking contradiction. I really am. I can't deal with um, child child abuse where like there's no survivor. I can't deal with that stuff. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy those stories, but I do. I'm very interested in, in stories of mind manipulation where Stockholm syndrome's involved and, you know. Yeah, I get that. The psychology of that is very intriguing to me. It's scary. It really is. It really is. Because really, you can be, your your mind is so easily manipulated. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're taking advantage of people who... Are vulnerable. Yeah, are vulnerable, or they count on you, or they think you're their friend, or it's just like... Mm-hmm. You know, also with her, there was like everybody was... She was the source of everyone's survival, their food, their right. clothing, their sustenance, you know, any anything and everything. So it's like... It's hard for them to leave, you know? Yeah. Especially the children, of course. Right. Well, you know, on a a lighter note, if you took my pets aside, if my pets were allowed to talk, like if they were given the the gift of voice and communication, Uh they would probably say the same thing about me. What, that you're mean to them? That I'm mean to them, that I I withhold their food and bathroom time, (laughs) that I'm trying to kill them. Yeah, I'm sure. I've seen your uh, sausages on legs. I know that's not true. (laughs) You're definitely not withholding food. (laughs) Definitely not. Anywho, um, so that was my story last week. And I will remind you that Dana has included time stamps in the story. So if you do not care for our little charming, carefree banter, just skip Skip right on ahead. That's right. Yeah, you're a stranger to us. We don't blame you. Go straight to the darkness. (laughs) Right. So what are you going to tell us about? Yeah, this week we're not going to be so, so dark. I am going to tell you about England's longest serving spy. 
So another English story. I yeah. like it. England, yeah. you know what? A lot of uh, true crime and, you know, podcasts, they focus a lot on shit that happens in the U.S. But outside of the U.S., there's this whole world. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not just for television. The story, she's a spy for England, but she is not British, so. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I gotta say, I got a message from one of our friends in Scotland. Uh Uh-huh. And they ended their message with a little X at the end, which is their thing. Instead of doing LOL or an emoji face, they actually do a little X at the end of their text message. No way. And I learned this on TikTok. And if you don't do an X at the end of your text messages, people are like, why are you mad at me? What? (laughs) So they actually, when they messaged me today, I was like, oh my God, I got my first ex from uh, one of our UK listeners. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) That's cute. I didn't know that. It's like if you text a teenager with any punctuation, Mm -hmm. they're like, what's your problem? Why are you mad at me? (laughs) Natalie always used to say that, but I'm like, girl, I'm a teacher. I, I have like... Sentence structure. Yeah, I have sentence structure. I can't just like, you know, I'll put a question mark. Yeah. Or if I'm mad, I'll put like, if it's an angry question, I'll put question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point. Right. I'm extra mad questioning you. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Dana's going to tell us about this English spy. Yeah. But first, the food. Let us pray. Bless us, O patrons, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy donations through Patreon every month. Under the power of the V. Bad bitches. Colt. That's a fucking baby hen. I can't eat that child. (laughs) Well, you've had it before because I've made you Cornish hens in the past. Yeah. I love a little Cornish hen. Are Cornish hen little people hen? No. That's a baby hen? Nydia. It's a little chicken. But is it an adult little chicken or is it a baby chicken? It's a different breed of chicken. It's a different breed of bird. So, but it is, right? It's like, it's not, that's not a baby. No, it's not a baby. It's a, bitch, you eat lamb and pig's feet and all kinds of other crazy intestine and shit. Yeah, but that looks like a fully formed chicken, only miniature. Nydia, it's a you've Cornish had game Cornish hen. hens before. Oh, it just, it's like looking at me in the face. Like, that's a little body. Are you okay? Like, what are you okay? I'll eat it. I, I'll, I'll be I happy about fully, it. <laughs> I fully fed this to you for Christmas last year. Yeah, really? definitely. Yes. They just look like that. Mm-hmm. Yes. I probably just served it up on the plate so you didn't notice it was like came like a chicken. That looks like a fucking You never baby. made a whole chicken before? Yeah, but not that tiny little guy. <laughs> that's, oh a, that's a baby. It's not. It's a Cornish game hen. It's like a different kind of bird. It's oh. like if you ate a duck or like... It's a different bird. They're just little. Okay. Like a quail, but like not really. Okay. It's a Cornish game hen. Uh, why'd you do that little I don't know. Don't look. they have little like things that they like flop around on their head? <gasps> they're cute. <laughs> the Since that when do you give a shit about though. that though? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. It just shocked me. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> that's because they normally serve it up to her on just the one half and just put it on her plate so that she yeah. doesn't realize wings how small it is. The little it. leg, the little leg's so tiny. It's the baby, it's the baby wings and the baby uh legs <laughs> that are doing it for me. They're like chicken wings. Sadly, you've already had them cuz I fed this to you. This feels wrong. Okay. Well, so this morning I sent you a text <laughs> message about the theme, and I said Polish or Jewish, Polish slash Jewish food. Mm-hmm. So what do we have here? Well, we have the Polish kielbasa mixed in with Polish potato dumplings. Mm-hmm. Potatoes. Yes. Potatoes. 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 <laughs> um, there's <laughs> mushrooms and onions and kielbasa and bacon all thrown into okay, that side. Right. but I know how weird you are about... Uh, encased meat yes i don't love it but i do like kielbasa isn't that weird Ugh, you kill me because i wouldn't have bought the gameish corn ga- gameish corn hens the co- <laughs> no i, do, I don't cornish cornish hens. Hens. <laughs> the i don't hens. i don't love encased meat you're not wrong about that. okay yeah, so that's I'll why probably i probably pick the, the skin off you're fine but that's why i bought the the hens you're sweet and, you don't have to do that i keep telling you you don't have to do that, that kind of stuff said, for me because I knew you were going to get something you didn't like. I also made a dessert that Nydia might not like. <laughs> and I was going to bring her a piece of cheesecake and I totally forgot that. Oh. So Yeah, it's you don't have to do that for me. I will eat things I don't like. I'm like a full-ass adult that will eat plenty of things that I don't like. Okay, 
This right. smells delicious it's, if it's, it's any yeah, it consolation. Smells so good. Good. All right, let's go for it. How was your baby chicken? <laughs> um, I felt bad at first, but once I got a taste, I, ha- I have a little pile of baby bones. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I feel so bad. <laughs> They're the tiniest little bones. I know. And eating a drumstick made me feel like a giant. <laughs> I feel like this giant person eating like this chicken. You're like the giant that lives in the clouds, like Jack and the Beans. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I pretended that it was a turkey because it's shaped like a fucking turkey. Yeah, I mean, poultry usually all shape very similarly. I mean, if we cooked a parrot, it would be the same. You think? I, have you ever seen one of those parrots that like walk around on the videos where they pluck all their hair off and they like just look like a raw chicken like walking around? Oh my god, that's so sad, Dana. They do that because they're mentally ill. <laughs> do it because they're anxious. Yeah, they're mentally ill. Okay, I mean, but it still looks like a tiny chicken <laughs> no, walking around. We're not gonna make light of parrots' mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. All right, I'm sorry. I'm so, that was too far. Too far. That was too far for me. You're right. So, yeah. So sorry. <laughs> um, what did you think of the dumplings? See, I her the, the food was delicious. Yeah. Cindy is a whiz with the spices. Yeah. I must say she threw in some bacon and some mushrooms, my two favorite things. She could have literally been serving me vomit and as long as the mushrooms and the bacon were in there <laughs> my fucking God. hard disagree. <laughs> no, I yeah, but but the potatoes they were they were good it was like a gnocchi right gnocchi it's very similar to a gnocchi but bigger i guess you could say what are we drinking so what we're drinking i haven't actually tried it <laughs> nidia's making me scared to try it it's strong i don't think it's, it's that strong. strong at all it's strong and then cindy's got a cinnamon stick floating in it that for a second a split second looks like a burnt out cigarette <laughs> Like a cigarillo? Like a cigarillo, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Oh, my God. I'm like, oh, somebody put is a cigarillo it, is in Is there apple glass. juice in it? Yes, there is. Okay. So this is called a zarladka. Oh. It's the Polish apple juice and vodka cocktail. All right. So it's basically vodka, apple juice, and cinnamon. I mean, it's I'm, I don't hate it. Yeah, no, it's good. It's just hard to, like knock them back like i usually do (laughs) i think that maybe that's for the best she only brought us enough for one yes and that was on purpose yeah we are adults you need to let us decide how much liquor is good for us barely adults zlarka is actually polish apple pie so that's why they they call this drink that it does taste like an apple pie yeah it really does yeah Mm -hmm. you know i didn't have it without the ice in it so i just went and got everybody ice nydia had so i don't know um a comparison it's a lot stronger but it's it's good i I think it's pretty good yeah i Mm -hmm. prefer it over wine honestly what yeah blasphemy I enjoy it in addition to wine. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. So, you know, we, we took a break. We changed the podcast name. This is a this is a whole new podcast. Forget about Wine Night and Storytime. Yeah. That's- and, and you know what? In all fairness, our, our break went on a bit longer because yeah. I lost my dad. Right. And so we took some time off. Definitely. That being said, it's a new year. We, we in, in, in podcasting world. Right. In... In the realm of the crime diner, yeah. it is the week of New Year's. The, the week of New Year. Right. We're, literally, it yeah, is. Like currently for us, for us right now. it's the week of New Year. <laughs> right. So we just shockingly got the news. Not just. Well, she, the I mean, day before. Yeah, yesterday. Whatever. Day before yesterday. Yeah. I, I'm still utterly shocked. I mean, reeling. I'm reeling. That the queen. Yeah. Betty White has passed away. I know. We know this is not news to you guys. But we felt like we still wanted to talk about it. I was at work. When you found out? Yeah. I was already feeling like New Year's not my favorite holiday. It just isn't. New Year's Day or New Year's Just Eve. the holiday in general. Usually Christmas, I guess I'm on a high from Christmas or right. I'm not or whatever, however I feel about Christmas or birthdays. I just... Like holidays, I, I'm not like somebody who gets like overly... Excited. About holidays, right. right. But New Year specifically since... 2000 i just historically have had shitty new years 
New Year's Eve's, okay. I guess. New Year, New Year's Eve. Last year was it was quiet and chill, and I and I enjoyed it, and it was nice. But like this year, I was just like, I just wasn't feeling it. You know, I was at work. New Year's Eve was my last day of work. I'm out of work for six weeks for okay. stuff that's happening with my job or whatever. And so I was like, that was what I was excited about. Like, we're leaving. This is my last day of work. So I was like thinking about my last client. I'm like, this is going to be my last client of the year. And I always think that at the end of the year. I'm like, this is the last person I'm going to work on this year. And I get a text message from my son. And all it says is, she fucking died. Because he had texted me like a series of text messages. But the first one I saw was, she fucking died. And I was immediately, his girlfriend is here from New York. And I was like, oh my God, did his girlfriend die at my house? Like, what the fuck? And I like opened my, my (laughs) stomach, like dropped to my knees and I opened up the text message and it was Betty White died. She fucking died. It was just like, that was how I found out. And I was like, not better, not better, not (laughs) Not better, no, not better at all. And then just like, I'm laying on the couch. I was, you know, in my pajamas for new year and just TikTok after TikTok after TikTok of like people singing the song and like right. talking about Betty White. And I was like, this is so fucking sad. Like, it's just so sad. It's also, also, she did like, she pulled like the ultimate Irish exit where she's just like, goodbye. Yeah. Like, she didn't even say goodbye. She just fucking peaced out. And it was, was like, such a punch in the face because. Literally, like, a couple of days before, it was like, she's going to make it to 100. This is crazy. She's going to be 17 days. I know. I was planning to watch her 100th episode, birthday episode thing that she was doing. I didn't even know about that, but I'm just... I mean, I went to see Spider-Man, and they were advertising for it at the movie theater. Oh, really? So we were all fully aware that there was going to be a 100th fucking birthday extravaganza. And she was like, you know what? Yeah, no. No, I'm not going to do that, actually. I think I'm going to sleep in. (laughs) (laughs) I did see a funny TikTok that, like, you know how they people portray, like, the devil or God or whoever, and they'll go back and forth as their self. And it was like, he was, the guy was like an angel, and he was like... Did you get that old white lady? And he's like, yeah, I got her. And he's like, kind of weird you made me take her just before her 100th birthday. And then God's like, the queen is only 95. And he's like, the queen? He's like, is that Betty fucking white? What the fuck is wrong with you? (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, that was the first one that made me laugh about it. (laughs) Oh, no. Which also would be very sad if the queen died. But like for us over here. Right. I mean, that was like the equivalent i mean mm-hmm. we're we're just as sad yeah as i think people will be when the queen goes well i was preparing for a new year's eve dinner and my wife comes down the steps just full sobbing nothing but Ugh. wet face and tears and showing me that she passed and i'm like i i, I can't i can't I, I, i'm like nope i nope, texted gage back I and i was like i'm just gonna go to bed i was like i'm done with this i'm i'm done yeah. with this i can't take one more thing i'm done and I did. I came home. I got my pajamas. I stayed up to do the live with Cindy, and that was it. I just imagine her, like, just, you know, I, I don't know. I just imagine her just doing it her way. Do you know who Glennon Doyle is? No. She's, like, an author. She writes, like, uh, I don't want to say self-help books, but, like, she's a therapist or something. And okay. she writes good books that are, like, anyway, she had made a tweet that was, like, Maybe Betty White just didn't want you to be mad at 2022, so she left, like, before, Mm -hmm. so that you wouldn't... Oh, so that you wouldn't start the year off. You wouldn't start the year off with that sadness, because she would know how sad you were. And I was like, that's... That's the most Betty White thing I've ever heard, honestly. That, yeah. That's, yeah, honestly. You yeah, know, I yeah. saw that. They were like, because I think all of us would have automatically given up. Yeah, we'd be like, fuck 2022. We're done right, with that. Right, And honestly, that really feels like a Betty White. Like, just watching all of these videos of her and, like, you know, she's just, like, she's funny and she says dirty things, but then she says, like, the sweetest, nicest thing and you're just like, yeah. god damn it, She was man. probably like, let me just give these kids some hope for 2022. Yeah, 2022 is going to be okay. At least Betty White didn't die in 2022. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's not speak that into existence. (laughs) Truly. I mean, yeah. I just, you know, the the one thing I will say about it, and we, we can move on from here, but like, it is nice to know that like, she's the most like bipartisan thing. Like everybody across the board, you know, spanning 
race and age and political agenda, we're all sad about Betty White dying. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, there's nobody that's like, nah, fuck Betty White. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, okay, at least we can all agree on this, that this is really fucking sad. Yeah, exactly. Um, so with that being said, how was your New Year's? That was my New Year, man. I, I came home, I got my pajamas. I you did just... I did a little cry on the couch, and then I, uh, I, I was, I let it go. 2022, 2021's done. A Betty White cry, or was it just, just a, like in a general? Dana? Yeah, like a, a, like this is sad. I forgot I hated New Year. I definitely don't like it. Huh. It's always sad. I cry every new, almost every New Year. Really, I didn't last year, but in in the grand scheme of the last since the two thousands. Yeah, I just, I really don't like that holiday. You know what I don't like about New Year's? I don't, I don't like expectations. I don't like, right. I don't like expectations for anything. Right. I, I, I am not an expectations girl. Yeah. Because I don't like being let down. And usually when you have these, you know, expectations of right. this like fabulous thing, it, it always lets you down. Right. So what we did this year was I gave my niece money and I'm like, here, go to town, whatever you want to make, whatever you want to, you know, but, I, but yeah, but I'm not taking care of it. You're the younger crew coming yeah, up. That's right. This is all you. So um, we, we all got together. I mean, and we're fucking sad. We are sad, broken people. Right. We just lost my dad. Yeah. So my mom, I didn't want her staying home, you know, being depressed and everything. And that's where the day was heading. So he was the type of person that always was up for a party he Your didn't dad. care yeah. yeah he was just like always up for so a party fun. yeah such a fun guy and it's not like my house was any fun for him you know because we're just like fucking doing stupid young people shit that he didn't get right yeah but he liked the aliveness of it all right mm -hmm. and my mother always hated going out so she would he would always force her so she's sitting at home and she says i don't feel good i have a bit of a cough i don't feel good um, and also I'm sad. I don't want to be around anybody. I'm just going to go to bed. Yeah. Um, right around six o'clock when everybody was, you know, supposed to come over for new year's. Um, I'm talking about just my immediate family. Um, he, not he, what am I saying? He, um, the internet goes out. Yeah. He did that. And my mom was like, fuck, what am I going to do? I have to yeah. get up and go to Nidia's house. She's the only one with internet right now. <laughs> so, so she came yeah, He over. was like, no, you're going to that party. Yeah. He, but here's the funny thing. She could have been on her phone. She has internet on her phone, but she, she couldn't watch the Netflix. Right, or, right, you know. right. So anyway, so she came over and, um, and we had a really nice new year. It really, it was, it was understated. And mostly done in honor of what he would have liked, yeah. you know? So that's, that's what so we good. did. Yeah, and we played games. We played Family Feud. We played Flip Cup. We drank. So we just, fun. Yeah, we sang karaoke. It was it was a lot of fun. And good. I'm really glad that we did that. Good. And I didn't want to. So sometimes you have to force right. yourself. Yeah. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. What about your new year? I cooked. I ate. And then I went live. <laughs> right i did join the live because i knew she was i kept being like i'm going to bed at nine o'clock and then i was just laying here watching tiktok and then it was like 11 30 i'm like well i guess i might as well stay up and watch the live situation happen i will say you know yesterday and today just like laying here watching tiktoks or whatever and watching the new year celebration i don't i didn't watch it of course right. i don't yeah i don't need or whatever but the andy cohen getting like fucking totaled on tv and just like talking shit to what? anderson cooper oh my god is yes so fucking funny he like was straight talking shit on t on it's hilarious it's the funniest shit i ever seen he who's gets, andy cohen He's the guy from uh, Bravo that like interviews all the Desperate Housewives and all the like. You gotta look it whatever. up. He looks like Anthony Bourdain. He does kind of look like that. Yeah. Somebody was like, I never realized how much Andy Cohen looks like Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, <laughs> like, he, he does. does. <gasps> like oh my god, he could play his double. <laughs> yeah, he does. So he was talking shit. Just it's fucking hilarious. Like he gets so drunk and he's like talking shit to Anderson Cooper. <gasps> or, like he's like. Go ahead. Yeah, it's like Anderson Go Cooper every year has to babysit Andy Cohen yeah. for New Year's because they've done it for a couple years. And he's always trash drunk, except this year he was trash drunk and just trashing de Blasio. Yeah, he was like talking about the mayor. <laughs> 
And and you can see Anderson Cooper just trying to pull him off like, of the bike. He's and- putting his arm around him like, it's okay, guys. And he's like, nah, he's the worst. No one likes him, blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. And then he, like, says something to Anderson Cooper, like, you like doing that in the bedroom, don't you? Like, whatever he said. And <gasps> no. Anderson Cooper's like, excuse because you know Anderson Cooper don't play that shit. No. He is a true, like... He's classy. He's a classy broad. Yeah. He was like... You could see the the look on his face like, tomorrow when you're sober, I'm going to punch you square in the fucking face. It's so Dude, funny. all of the... I just looked him up because I forgot what his face looked like. All of the uh, headlines for the things <laughs> is uh, Andy Cohen overserved on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> overserved himself you you gotta watch it because it is it is it, it's like it's the one time in the year that news reporters just get to be like who cares it's new year get as drunk as you want no one gives a shit damn <laughs> it's hilarious Ooh. so dana's going to greece yeah i'm going to greece and of course we are at you know when i booked this trip i did not expect stupidly did not expect a peak in COVID. A COVID mutation. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's like, it's dumb that I didn't expect it, right? Because it's like everybody got together at Thanksgiving, you know, would be getting together at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And like, so of course, like there's all of these like COVID restrictions and you have to get tested 72 hours and you have to get tested 24 hours before you leave the country. When you leave Greece? When you leave America to go to Greece. But, but. And then I have to get tested to come back, of course. Oh, but the problem is, the problem that I was having was that I, you can't get tested anywhere because everywhere's overflowed yeah. with people who are Did you already trying book to it? test. The test? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going tomorrow morning. So it's just, it, I, that was part of why I was like just not feeling great for New Year's because it was just like, my it was just anxiety and right. like chaos and, and I didn't get to see my family for Christmas because they all got COVID, you know, everybody right. got COVID or was exposed to COVID and then later found out that they did have COVID. So it was just like, I'm like, damn, this is fucked, man. Right. But I think we're good. I mean, my, th- this was part of it. I had convinced myself that my son had COVID when he was like, I definitely don't. And I was like, but you have a stuffy nose. And he's like, I always have a stuffy nose. <laughs> and I'm okay. like, Go get tested. So it took us forever to get, find him to get tested. He sat in a drive through test facility for three and a half hours. Oh no. He wanted to kill me. And then, you know, normally it's like 24 hours or 48 hours. We didn't get it back for 72. And I was like, we killed my grandmother. We killed Cindy and Nydia. We killed <laughs> we, everybody. Like, I just, like, had made my... I had worked myself up so right. much into a tizzy for them to text him and be like, you don't have COVID. And he's like, would you chill the fuck out? And I'm like, you know, so then, you know, he wanted to go to his cousins right now. I'm like, you can't, you can't, okay. And he's just yeah. like, girl, you need to chill the fuck out because this is like, you know... Yeah, but I mean, he ain't wrong. You ain't wrong. I'm not. Well, I'm not. You like, paid for this trip, right? It's not like I'm making this up. Like, right. You know, Omnicrom or whatever the fuck it's. Right, Omicrom. but you're not even Omaria. like <laughs> everybody is getting sick. Like, right. even vaccinated people. So exactly. I'm not making a thing up. No, I'm just like, if we weren't going to Greece, I probably would be like, okay, fine. If we get COVID, that would suck, but like, it wouldn't cost me three grand. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Or like right. whatever. Right. So it's just, I oh, just so fucking stressed. I'll be like. I, w- I was like, I should just cancel this trip. This is crazy. Could you imagine like, if you get stuck over there? That would be unfortunate. Yeah. That Do you would... have trip insurance? Yes, I bought trip insurance. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's a... What a time to yeah. be alive. <laughs> it was like... The, no, when I was younger and I would like travel or whatever. I don't fucking book yeah, trip insurance. That's it's trip so stupid. Why would I do right? that? And then... Like, my dad got caught in a hurricane on a cruise. Oh, yeah. And then what happened with us with the hurricane in Costa, in Costa Rica. And then my dad and stepmom went on a cruise fucking February of 2020. They were, like, the boat before the boat that got no. stuck. Yes, they were. Oh, my God. Maybe your parents should not go oh, on Oh, my vacation. God. They're going on a cruise again. And I was like, are you guys okay? Like, do you have a death wish? Like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, no. So, yeah, I was like, when I was booking this trip, I was like, how much is the trip insurance? Yeah, I'm definitely getting that. Like, yeah, definitely getting that because because of COVID, like anything could happen. They can change the rules at tomorrow, and we yeah. w- we wouldn't be going. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, that's all very dramatic, but that's well, what my chest has been dealing with for the last like couple of weeks. Right. And here on this podcast, we have decided that we are no longer playing party to that whole resolution set of Mm-mm. ideas that you have to be a better person every year. You know what? Right. If if I feel like it, I'll fucking do it. And if that's I right. don't, I'm not setting any more resolutions. Yeah. Oh, you know what we did do though? Um last year at my um at my when we got together last year for New Year's, I had everybody put in a jar Two things. One thing that they would like to have left behind and one thing that they're looking forward to happening in the year. Okay. So we, I forgot about the fucking jar yeah. and everybody just anonymously did theirs, you know? And I forgot about the jar, found it two days ago, pulled it out. Perfect. And we read through everybody's like little wishes. So cute, yeah. And it's so funny because um, most of us had our wishes come true. That's good. You know, the goals that we set. Yeah. Um, yeah, like my niece was like, she wanted to start, she had just started her YouTube channel and yeah. she was like, I want to get to a thousand followers. And she like broke through that and yeah. then some, yeah. you know? So she was like, oh my God, that's so funny that we did that. That's you know? so sweet. So it was really, it was actually really cute. And and we did it again this year. So that's good. That's a good yeah. little tradition. That's so fun. Yeah. It was really fun because you, they didn't remember that we did that. Yeah. So pulling that out, it was like, oh, that's where my head was. That's yeah. where my, you know. Yeah. It was nice. That's sweet. Yeah. Better me for the new year. It's like, fuck that. I'm, I'm as good as it's going to get. <laughs> I might get worse. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. the, you know, the problem is we've, we, you know, generationally and, and you guys and the generation before us, you know, really had that mindset beat into us of like, you got to lose weight in January and it's a fresh start and you got to have the blah, blah. And we're just like. Yeah, this, all of this, all of what's happened to the whole world over the last couple of years is like, yeah, I mean, are you, are you good? Are you surviving? Like, how you doing? You breathing? You getting food? You you like, I think that'll be, that's fine, right? Listen, I'm, I'm all for a resolution that's all fine and well, because it's better, better to, to try than not have tried. You know what I'm saying? Like, if if you feel like you want that improvement. you want that, right, yeah. Yeah. But there's all this pressure that you need to do this. Right. And you really don't need to do anything. You are fine existing. You're fine. Existing as you are, you are fine. Unless, of course, you're not fine. Right. You know, but you don't need to do it for anybody else. You need to do it for yourself, you know? Sure. So I, all I'm saying is you don't have to pack yourself into a fucking gym come this January yeah. or whatever. Just do it when it feels right for you. Yeah. You know, if you want that, if you even fucking want that, how yeah. about we all make a resolution to gain 10 pounds and Ooh, actively go it. after that? Nailed it. <laughs> say no. I'm, I, I I'm just saying, that, honestly. I'm just saying, <laughs> resolutions never come true, right? So yeah. let's resolve to fucking gain 10 pounds. Let's resolve to lose money for once. Well, <laughs> I do know? that every time. Don't worry about that. <laughs> let's resolve to, you know. I do love like like goal setting in that like, I'd like to travel five times this year, or I'd like to, you know, things that are like enjoyable and pressure free. And if it doesn't happen, then it's something to look forward to next year or so, you know, right. whatever. But like to put something on yourself in the beginning of the year is like, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. And then if you don't do it, you're like, I'm a loser. I suck. I have right. worth. It's just like, why set yourself up like that? Yeah. Yeah. That's what or I, I want to like. save 50, you know, dollars a week. And it's like, but my car broke down and then you didn't do it. And it's just like all of this negativity that's surrounding it. It's just yeah. like, why, why are we doing that to ourselves? You know, Steve Harvey has this thing. I saw this on TikTok or I saw this somewhere. Yeah. And he said that, um, you should set yourself a 300 things like a vision board, 300 okay. things. And, um, every year, every so often you go back and you check how many of those you were able to check off. Like what we did, remember that 101 and 1001. Yeah. And when you look back, you're like, Oh, I did that. Yeah. And you know, or I checked this one off, you know, and look at all the things that I was able to do in a thousand and one days. Yeah. You know, I have that book in my car. I drive around with it. Oh my God. I changed your life that way too. (laughs) But there was such a hero. (laughs) You're such a dickhead. <laughs> and there, you know, I open it every now and then. And I've I've been many times able to cross things off of it and many times not. Um, part of it, you know, I got fucked over because of COVID, right. you know. But also, I will say, much of it I was able to complete because of COVID. Really? Like the bike riding stuff and like, oh. you know, exercising in a way that like I enjoy. Right. You know, like I, I, I think one of the things on my list was ride my bike five times. I rode my bike every day for six months to the point that I was, 
up to 25 and 30 miles a day. Like yeah. that was a thing that I never thought would happen and only happened because of COVID. Cause when I went back to work, I was not able to continue to do that. Right. All right. Well, do you want to have dessert? Yes. Let's queen. do it. What is it? What is that? They are Polish lemon tea cookies. They're fucking gigantic. First of all, that is not a tea cookie. It this is, is like not. the, the <laughs> cookies are like Wait. the size of like a half dollar. This is like the size of my fist. This is, <laughs> yes, I did not realize that. Yeah. I, I I have no idea how to make cookies because I don't normally don't make cookies. Yeah. Um. So when I looked it up, I said that it makes thirty five cookies. I'm like that does there's not make four cookies thirty five <laughs> cookies. Um. Okay. Let me put this in context. They are the size of a teacup platter. <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> They're humongous. What are they for? So with? it's a tea cookie it's because tea it's cookie. the size of a fucking teacup platter. <laughs> They're gigantic. It's they call it lemon icing, but it's it's kind of a buttercream. It's a lemon flavored buttercream. Holy shit! This episode is fucking giant. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fucking Lilliputian. <laughs> tiny, tiny baby chicken. Giant, giant cookie. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to feel like um, like a little tiny little creature. Where it's like an a Alice mouse. in Wonderland episode. Where yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> eats the tea, grows real big. <laughs> eats the chicken, <laughs> grows real small. Wow. Okay, All right. Let's, let's have it. Let's have it. That gigantic saucer <laughs> of a cookie um i liked eating cindy's cookie though yeah. i didn't think i was gonna like it but she turned me i like cindy's cookie too. i like that cookie it's big but it's a good cookie i mean of course cindy's <laughs> cookie's big come on <laughs> <laughs> cindy's the cookie itself very mild flavor yeah very but once like you a get sugar in, cookie, just like a regular old sugar there, cookie once you get in there the cream is tangy <laughs> it's it very, was it was yeah, really that, tangy it was hurting my throat damn it was it was bitter a little bitter <laughs> really it's called it's, it's called lemon it's lemony no it was so good i think the the fact that the cream had so much flavor and the cookie was so mild it really worked well together right it, yeah that was so good that was an ode to uh remember the episode of saturday night live where betty white comes on and she's talking about her her dry muffin <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> about how her muffins were moist <laughs> that shit sent me this is the fucking best oh god so sad well do you want to hear a story finally absolutely okay this is where people who came here to hear content <laughs> the moment you've been waiting for. yes the moment you fast forwarded to hey you there do you like podcasts Are you tired of the bullshit? Well, this is not the podcast for you. Actually, it is. And we are... The The Lords of Swine. We discuss nerd culture. And we drop every Tuesday... On any platform. We're literally everywhere. So I got my story from Wikipedia, NotableBiographies.com, and MilitaryHistory.org. So I'm going to tell you the story of Christina Starbeck, a.k.a. Christine Granville. She was the first woman and longest serving person to work for Britain as a special agent during the Second World War. I feel like there were a lot of spies during that time. Yeah, definitely. Also, when do they get uncovered as a spy? Like, do they get decommissioned? And then like, hey, guess what? They were a spy the whole time. Is that how that works? Well, I mean, for what happened with her, and we'll get into it, but it was after the war. Right, so after the war's over, they're like, ha! take a bow guys like, yes yeah. sort of but it's not always the case and what a lot of times happened with world war ii and spies they there were so many nazis that went on the run that a lot of uh, you can't call them fbi agents because they worked for you know britain and in israel and in other countries so i don't know whatever they have other agencies yeah. agency would be called but they went on the hunt to find you know nazis that moved and hid to in Argentina and right. like, you know, then of course we had the cold war. So then, you know, they transitioned into fighting the Soviet union and then eventually the Russians. So it, it, it 
so it would behoove a lot of them to stay undercover. Right. But that's not what happened with Christine. Okay. Count Jerry Scarbeck was a Roman Catholic and a banker, and he had gotten himself into some debt and financial trouble. So his family set him up in a marriage of convenience to Stephania Goldfeder, but she's the daughter of a wealthy, assimilated Jewish family, and they got married in December of 1899. So after the wedding, Jerry used her dowry to pay his debts and then continue to live this lavish lifestyle. They had their first son, and then uh, his name was Andrew, and then their daughter, Christina, And she was born in 1908 in Warsaw, Poland. So she took after her father's side. She really loved to ride horses. And she would ride astride the horse instead of side saddle like women usually did at the time. She was... It didn't take a lot of encouragement from her father to be a tomboy. Like, she was in it. She loved, like, adventure and action. And she just, like, wanted to, like, play and party. And she was just, like, this fun, vivacious little kid, you know? Right. Girls just want to have fun. Yeah, definitely. She was an expert skier and she visited the mountains in southern Poland a lot, all the time. In the 1920s, the family hit some financial difficulties like many families did. And they had to give up their country estate and move to Warsaw. So that he was like, boo. Yeah, right. So he was like a count. And so the wife was the countess. And, right. you know, they, they come from noble blood. But... Right. He was terrible with money, and so her family, the his wife's family had money. The mother's family had money. Right. And he just, like, fucking blew through it. You know, he just was very irresponsible with money. So they had to give up their countryside estate, and they moved to Warsaw. Uh, in the 1930s, Christina was 22 years old, and her father died. The Goldfeder financial empire had been almost completely wiped out by his spending and their lifestyle, There was really not enough for the widowed countess to survive and for her, you know, to support the children. That seems like a running theme, though, with like counts. Yeah, yes, definitely. Because they don't like, they don't keep the money like (laughs) this. Exactly. (laughs) They don't keep count. But I mean, remember when I did that story of the guy that killed and, and. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and he was a count too. Right. Fucking broke. Right. Did you watch Downton Abbey? I mean. Um. (sighs) So that's my favorite show. Oh my god! You know they're coming out with a movie in April. Just saying. So you know. Another one? Yes. Yeah. Stop! They did go. the Christmas movie, and you I could can't. not find that anywhere. I know you can't ever find them anywhere. <laughs> I mean, no, it's going to be in the movie theater in April. Oh shit! The finances are almost completely gone. So Christina, not wanting to be a burden to her mother, she decided she was going to get a job. So she worked at a Fiat car dealership. You know, she worked in like the offices. She worked above the like automotive repair area. So all of these fumes would come up into the vents and, you know, it started to affect her lungs. And a lot of people got sick at the Fiat dealership. Jesus. She got some x-rays of her chest and it, they believed that she was suffering from tuberculosis, which is what had killed her father. But then they realized it was this, these fumes from the Fiat agency. And she was able to receive some compensation from her employer's insurance company And she was able to, you know, move back into like a more like her doctors suggested that she live a more like life outside in the air to like get fresh air in her lungs and things like this. So she should be like horseback riding and skiing. And I wish my doctor would say that shit. Yeah, honestly, I I hate the truly. (laughs) But she so she began to spend a lot of time outside hiking, and she got a little bit of money, but. You know, still not enough to live. She was considered to be very beautiful. And in 1930, she was uh, one of the runners up in the Miss Poland Beauty Contest. Very pretty girl. On April 21st, 1930, she married a young businessman, Gustav Getlich. They ended up not being a very good match for each other and got divorced after a couple of years. She did not love to be married. Neither do I. just like... Love that single life. It's the 30s. It's the flappers. It's the, you know, it's the, the, you know, the late 20s, the early 30s. She's just like not about that wife life. Right. She like gets to live around aristocratic people. She's grown up around them. She's rode horses with them. She goes skiing with them. Like, you know, she's just like about that single life. Right. That sounds so fun. So fucking fun. She got a little bit of money and then... After the divorce, she gets a little bit more money. So she's like, she's doing all right, Okay, you know? But, you know, she's dated other men here and there, but it was difficult for her to find a husband because she was a divorcee. (gasps) Gasp. 
you know how we feel about divorces. Well, how, how does 1930s feel? They don't about? like it. No. <laughs> they don't like it at all. I'm twice divorced. She <laughs> she started dating some guy and she like thought maybe they were in love and he was going to propose to her. And his mother invited her to lunch. <gasps> And she was like, okay, it's going to, like, she's going to, like, yeah, see whatever. I can see the writing on the wall. <laughs> and the mom was like, you're done. <gasps> you're done. No. She broke up with her. The mom broke. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Why? Because she found out she was divorced? I guess, yeah. She was like, you're not good enough for my son. Oh, Get my the fuck God. out of here. Yeah. Wow. And, like, just a series of things like that happened to her in her wow. early 20s, you know? So one day she's on a ski slope in Poland and Christina loses control and she's like flying down the mountain. Oh my God, you know, and this giant like Hulk of a man just comes out and like steps in front of her and catches her, you know, saves her from imminent death. You right. Know? And uh, her rescuer, oh his name is uh, Hearsay Gazeki, And he's just like this, he's older, he's a little bit older. He's like in his fifties. So he's way older. <laughs> he's yeah. Like, like twice her age. But he's like... He's a brilliant, moody, eccentric man. He comes from a wealthy family. He does not play by the rules. He previously worked in the United States as a cowboy, a prospector. He, like, was a um, chauffeur for um, the Rockefellers. Like, he was just, wow. like, he just was, like, living his life. He's he very world-traveled. And she was, like... Yeah, the, this is the kind of guy I need. Like, she wants excitement. She wants fun, you mm -hmm. know? Eventually, he had become an author, and he had traveled the world in search for materials for his books and things like that. And so on November 2nd, 1938, Christina married him. And their marriage was not the best. She found it very difficult to be a wife. And soon after the wedding, he had accepted a position in Ethiopia as like a diplomat to Poland through Ethiopia. He served as Poland's consul general. I don't know what the fuck that means, but that's what he did. So that was in September 1939. She hoped moving to Africa would be a good change. She's like, this is going to be so exciting. I don't love being a wife, but like, Right. Fucking Africa in 1930. Like, this I mean, is cool as shit, you know? Right. Africans might not love that, but she was like, hell yeah, yeah. this is going to be great. They arrive in Africa, and days later, Germany invades Poland. So they're in oh. Africa. They've been there like two fucking days, and their home country is under attack. And it's bad. You know, Poland, yeah. it's bad. They freak the fuck out. They sell their car. They're they're headed. They need to get back to Poland. They're, they're All of their family is there, like what the fuck we're we're about to uh, we're joining this world war you know right and they want to help they sell their car they get on a boat because they couldn't just like fly back into poland now right. you know so they get on this boat and it takes them slowly to london so while they're on the ship there's like a lost and found bulletin board every day like the ship crew would say what was lost or things that they found or whatever so like under the lost and found bullets report, it said like lost women's underwear. And then Wait, what? <laughs> whatever. That was what was missing that day. Okay. And then um, lost Warsaw. And that's how they found that. <gasps> they found out that Poland was lost to Germany. Okay. That may be not the women's underwear. <laughs> like those two things should not yeah. have been on the same bullet. So there board. was some like controversy of like, was this just like Britain's what? Because Britain was not in the war yet. You know, this okay. was, you know, Britain is not part of it yet at this point right so like and this was like a british boat to london so they were like were they just like it was funny like it was right. a joke but like there was a lot of polish people on the boat so they didn't take it that way like they didn't find it funny they were it was very tragic yeah. so that's how they found out that german forces had conquered their country by the time they arrived back in europe two hundred thousand polish people had been killed by germany that's insane yeah I mean, within... I can never wrap my brain around World War II. Yes. I can't. I just can't. The The death and destruction is just... So, like, what we were talking about with you last week, right. about, like, the things that, like, pique your interest, that, right. like, you just can't, like, understand it, but you want to... That's World War II for me. It's like, I could talk about every aspect of World War II until I'm blue in the face, because I just can't fucking understand right. how this shit happened. Right. And on the same note of me defending myself with telling <laughs> stories of torture, yeah. we totally did a World War II episode full of torture. Oh, yeah. Full of it. Yeah. I, you know, in the growth of this podcast, you know that I cringe at some of the early episodes right. you know and there there are some that i'm like oh maybe we should not have told that story especially right. after the trevor thing you know after the episode with trevor and the signal mountain murders and like having 
someone who was affected by it right. so deeply really made me be like, what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what are we doing right. with this podcast? Because these are people. Right. And, like, I get that you get that. And I know that I got that before. But, like, right. to have somebody reach out to me and be like, hey, you were talking about my dad. And that hurt my feelings. Even though he didn't say that. But, like, right, right. of course it did hurt his feelings because he reached out to us. And he wrote a fucking book about it. Right. So, like, yeah, it definitely makes but- me be like... But it also made me feel good that he approved of the way that we covered it. Definitely. And he thought we were respectful of it. Sure. So it's like, yeah. you know. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway, they arrive in London. It's October 6, 1939. Her husband tried to join the French army, like the Polish resistance of the French army. But he's like over 50. He's right. like recovering from a collarbone injury from skiing. Like he's got all these injuries because he's like an old dude. I mean, he's not an old dude, but for the time, he's like an old dude, you know? Yeah. And um, France is like, no, dude, go away. So she's like, but I can join. And they're like, woman, sit, sit down. down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but she eventually um, introduces, she was eventually introduced to the Secret Intelligence Service uh, in Britain. She had many, because of, she was born to account and where she grew up and she had a ton of contacts within Poland and she spoke a bunch of languages. Her mother was, spoke French, you know, was a French teacher. So she was able to, she was going to be a good asset, you know, and, right. they, and they saw that in her. And she already had a plan. She would go to Budapest, Hungary, which still was not, what? I, you said she would go to Budapest, Hungary. And for a minute there, I was just like, why didn't she eat? Like, in my brain, that's like the first thing that like popped in. And I was like, oh, you mean the, the country? Hungary. Yeah, yeah. Initially, uh, Hungary had not been taken over by the Nazis yet, or allied with, I guess they eventually allied with the Nazis, but um, they were still a neutral nation at this point. So she would go to Budapest, she would print propaganda leaflets, and ski into Poland across the Tatra Mountains, and give Polish people, the, the Polish resistance, actual news of what was happening outside of Poland, because all that they had at that point was... Nazi propaganda. She would also take on intelligence missions where she would get Polish resistance fighters and help them escape the country while skiing through the mountains. So she did all of this skiing. Yes. She knew the routes because when she was younger, she would smuggle cigarettes across the border <sighs> for fun because they had money. Right. Like she didn't have to do it. She like thought it was fun. For spare change. Yeah. She could see how much the Polish people needed more information that wasn't just Nazi propaganda, you know, like all they were getting was news like from the Nazis. So of course this is like vital to the resistance, you right. know, um, her first mission at the secret intelligence service was in December, 1939. She was described as a flaming Polish Patriot an expert skier and great adventurous. She was absolutely fearless. People were just like, this girl, she don't give a shit. Now on her mission to aid the Polish resistance, her marriage was like basically over in all yeah. the like legalities. On December 21st, 1939, she journeys to Budapest as a British secret agent. When she's in Hungary, she is saying that she's there because she's a journalist. So she was able to convince a Polish Olympic skier to help escort her across the mountains to so they would go like in groups she would get this like these skiers because there were some people that they were trying to like polish people that they were trying to get out of the country that weren't great skiers so it okay. was like useful to have people who knew the route really well they had people along the way that would like they would stop and get food from them and things okay. like this it was like this whole like setup. an underground railroad sort of yeah but for world war Two on skis yeah wow yeah that reminds me of the book that we read. The oh my Italian. god, yeah! I was just thinking that. Yeah, yeah. that where what they was did. That? It was an Italian guy. I can't remember. Yeah, but. And he was like skiing into like a Catholic church or something. Through, like, he, yeah, it was a connection with the Catholic some Catholic priest yeah. or something that they were escaping people. When she was in Poland, she was able to locate her mom. Even though Christina was not registered as Jewish, her mother was. Oh, shit. And Christina knew what was happening. You know, everybody knew what yeah. was starting to happen. And she pleaded with her mom, please just let's get you out of Poland. Let's get you out of here. And her mom who was loyal to Poland refused to go. She said she was secretly teaching children French. She was not leaving. 
And that was the last time Christina had seen her mother. Uh, the Countess Starbeck would be killed uh, in a Warsaw prison by the Nazis. Oh, that's so sad. Christina was traveling back and forth over Europe, and she met a, na- a man named Andrew Kowarski. And despite having most of, like, one leg missing, he had, like, had it shot off as a younger man, like, during a hunting accident. He still managed to become a Polish war hero before the invasion, and he had now been working for the Polish resistance with Britain. So he was also a British spy. I'm trying to picture his leg. Yeah, I don't know. Like, he was shot in the foot, so, like, I'm not exactly sure... What the fuck? Maybe he had, like, some sort of, like, amputee, like, what is that called? Like a... Prosthetic. Yeah, like, maybe he had some sort of prosthetic or something. I don't know. But in talking to him, she, you know, she introduces herself to him. They're going to be working together. And he's like, don't you remember me? And she's like, I don't know who the fuck you are. And he's like, we played together as children. My dad would bring me to your house. And you're, you know, while they did business, and they would, like, play with the horses and shit. So, like, he knew her from when they were children. Aww. The two of them began working together. They became friends, sometimes lovers. Ooh. I will say that Christina loved her some men. I like that. She loved yes. it. Go get it. Yeah, she was like about that Why life. Why not? Yeah. Also, so, I love a woman in the in the 19, you know, in the 19 aughts, whatever yeah. the fuck it was. Um doing the thing that nobody was doing yeah. and not giving a single fuck not about giving it. giving a single fuck. Yeah, she just was like I fucking love it. I'm a fucking spy, bitch. Ahead of her time. Yeah. For sure. Um, so she's like, yeah, like that's fine. So she's initially they're working in Hungary and that was okay until Hungary got taken over by the Nazis and it became really dangerous. So they were arrested in 1941 and interrogated by the Gestapo, which is normally like, it's a death sentence, you know? Oh, I mean, they would like beat the shit out of you until you like, I mean, the Gestapo was not, she was questioned. Yeah. They were arrested and they (gasps) were questioned. Oh shit. So what she does is she bites her tongue a bunch of times and fills her mouth with blood. And then she coughs in their face and <gasps> says she has tuberculosis. She like coughs oh, and like coughs shit. up all this blood. And they were like, tuberculosis, like, yeah, that was like, they were like, get the fuck out of here. And they just like threw them out. And she, yeah, but why got, didn't she, um, I mean, you would think they would just kill her so that he, she I couldn't think maybe they were it. thinking like she was already going to die. Plus, I don't know what their knowledge of TB was at the time. And I, I don't even know if it's true, but like, what if their bodies were still contagious? Like, you know, TB is like, it's like fucking COVID. Right. Like it's just in the fucking air blowing everywhere. Like if you got caught, like just get the fuck away from here. You know, yeah. that would be my assumption as to why they didn't kill them. But whatever, it worked and they got the fuck out of there. So they're released. They begin working with the British ambassador in Hungary and they were issued British passports. So Andrew became Anthony Kennedy and Christina became Christine Granville. And she would use this name for the rest of her life. She also took seven years off her passport, of off her age. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. She, she moved down seven years. I mean. So saying her birthday was 1915. A British embassy driver smuggled Christina out of Hungary and into Yugoslavia in the trunk of the ambassador's Chrysler. So she gets in the trunk. He drives her out of the country into Yugoslavia. Andrew drove his own car across the border under the guise of saying that he is a car dealer owner, a car salesman, and he's selling his automobile and he's dropping it off to the new owner. Okay, see you later. So once they're both in Yugoslavia, the couple move on to Bulgaria, which they realize is fucking full of Nazis. The reason they're there is because they're trying to deliver a microfilm from the Polish intelligence organization called the Musketeers that needs to be sent to Winston Churchill, like the big dog, you know? Right. So on these films contain images of the German military built up right on the German side of the Soviet Union, proving that Germany was about to attack Soviet Union, which is a big fucking deal. Like they, if they would have had that intelligence, you know, they could have prevented tons and tons of death. Like this is a very big deal. And especially like it's going to Winston Churchill. Right. They get the films to the people. They move them on to Winston Churchill and Winston Churchill initially doesn't believe it. He's like, this can't. It can't be. Like, they wouldn't dare fucking attack the Soviet Union. Especially, like, and if you know anything about World War II, like, they do, they end up attacking in the winter. Yeah. And it's, like, this whole big fucked up thing. Yeah. Um, But he does eventually get a a couple other bits of information, and he is able to warn the Soviet Union that Germany is planning to attack. So this is, like, very fucking good. They're, like, heroes. I'm wondering, like, how they got the footage. 
Th- so these musketeers, this um, Polish organization. Oh, they were the ones. They that were the ones, it. and so they gave it to her, okay, and got then it. she took it across the border okay. in the trunk of the fucking ambassador's car, like crazy. Did the ambassador know that she was? Yeah, back he was there? With, Okay, so yeah, he was in on yeah, it. Yeah, he's in on it. Yeah, oh, that sounds exciting. It's so fucking exciting. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so yeah, the Germans would go on to invade the Soviet Union in uh, 1941. But the Soviet Union knew it was coming. I think they had, like, initially Churchill didn't believe it. Then he was able to be convinced. Then he told the Soviet Union, and they were like, definitely they're not. And then they were able to be convinced. But I think Germany did have a big head start that... Okay. Because people just couldn't fathom that they would attack the way they were attacking. When you think of World War II, like, Hitler just, like, took country after country after country. And, like... To think that they could take on the Soviet Union with such a large landmass, like it just seemed crazy. Right. Like it would have, like you would think they would have attacked England first, or you know what? I mean, what the fuck do I know? I'm just saying. But so anyway, after all this, um, she sent to work for the British Special Operations Executive, the SOE. Now there was like some a little bit. I didn't really go into it where like the British people were like kind of suspicious of them because they were working with the musketeers and the musketeers were like technically like this terrorist organization. Like, but she sort of, she had proved herself, you know, but so initially they were like, Oh, I don't really right. like where you got this. I'm glad you got the information. We don't love where it came from type of situation. But so they initially like stopped working with her, but then she was hired with this, uh, SOE organization and they trained her, even though she had already proven herself very capable, she had to join this first aid nursing Yalmary. It was an all woman's charity organization with military style uniforms. And it was a cover for many women working under the SOE. So they were undercover working as nurses. Right. That's like how they would be like, oh, we're volunteering as nurses. But really right. they were, and they utilized women so much during the war because the Nazis just like very misogynistic, yeah. like just uh-huh. could not possibly fathom that women would give a single shit about war. Right. That women would just like go back and forth with their like baskets of bread and like their groceries. And like, she would do that with her little like basket of gro- with like grenades and shit underneath the bread. Like yeah. she was fucking crazy. Fucking she awesome. would have um, tons and tons of like leaflets of, anti-nazi propaganda and she'd be like oh i'm just like skiing across the border la, la, la. did you guys ever watch jojo rabbit i didn't i really oh want to see God. that that movie was so fucking that was based good. on a true story right i don't think so oh no i don't no, know it's got like it's it's a it's i feel like world I just... war ii from the pro from the uh point of view of a little german boy yeah who's expected to be a nazi yeah and he's training to be a nazi yeah. and like the nazi sc- scouts or whatever yeah yeah and his imaginary friend is hitler okay and um it's fucking Just don't hilarious tell me. Yeah, don't tell me anything because i think i'm gonna watch it it's tonight. sad it's it's funny it's hopeful it's such a fucking beautiful i wanted movie. to watch that and it was like right in the beginning of my like oh i can't watch things i'm getting anymore. chills talking okay. about it Uh, I'm going to watch that tonight. You should. Her briefing officer, Gwendolyn Leeds, is so impressed by Christina that she would eventually go on to name her daughter after her. What? Yeah, like people fucking loved her. (gasps) Despite all of her previous espionage experience, she had to go through training, like I said, and she was useless at wireless transmitting. She hated firearms. This bitch loved to parachute. Fucking loves it. Jesus Christ. So she becomes, a, you know, a fucking air person, like flies in the planes. And I was listening to this other podcast. because Isn't that a par- paratrooper? A paratrooper, I guess. Yeah. I was listening to this other podcast because this woman, uh, there's a woman that wrote a book about her. She wrote like a biography about her. And so she's done sort of like a couple of podcast circuits. Um, I can link them if you'd like, because she's very interesting. And she tells some stories that are not, you know. I didn't tell because I didn't actually have that information. Um, But she was basically saying that the women, the people who were trained for the parachuting, the men had to do two jumps. Like it was part of the training, two jumps. And women had to do three because, of course, women aren't incompetent and can't do anything that men can do. Is it because the the air gets under the skirt and they do Mary (laughs) Poppins kind of thing? She just like come down with her uh, umbrella. Yeah. No, she believed that it was part of a way to keep the women from ever completing 
the training. You know, uh, it was like a good way to keep them down. It's so stupid. But anyway, she completes the training. She's like the the best. Right. So their original plan was to parachute her into Hungary, but this was canceled and the reason it was canceled was deemed little short of homicide, quote unquote. Like she would be killed if she fucking parachutes into Hungary. So they just like scrapped the whole plan. But wait, why? Because it was in the middle of the fighting? Yes. Yeah, so like they were just like, we're Jesus definitely Christ. not fucking parachuting you in here. So the SOE decides to infiltrate her into southern France because she can speak French. She knows the area. She's re- she's a beautiful woman. Like, it's fine. Just, like, let's send her into France. She can do some shit while she's there. But they do send her to a course to improve her English because that's the one language that she, like, doesn't speak really? that well. Yeah. So she initially has to go to Algeria in preparation for her mission to France because the SOA believed that she was too flamboyant to work undercover effectively. Like, they were like, girl, you got to tone it down. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? She's just, like, too... Fabulous. Yeah, she's, like, too pretty. She's too, like, Polish. She's too, you know, just, like, you got to tone it down. The French are very French. Right. You know, like, chill the fuck out. You know, the Brits are very British. Right. Like, you can't be so glamorous. Just, like, settle the fuck down. Uh-huh. You have to be, like, you can't, if you, you can't draw attention to yourself if you're trying to be a spy, you know? Right. So, anyway, she is mostly going by Christine Granville at this point, and she parachutes into France on the night of July 6th and 7th, 1944. And she became part of a jockey network headed by Francis Camarets. The job of Camarets and his team was to organize the French resistance fighters in southeastern France and to weaken the Germans' occupiers in that area. You know, so we're going to help the Polish in this area and we're going to weaken the German situation. You know, whatever. War stuff. So Christina... (laughs) War stuff. So Christina arrives in the midst of this large operation where they're supplying the French resistance fighters with supplies and arms and ammunition by parachute. So she's out there every night by the moonlight collecting canisters that are being dropped by Allied planes and dispersing them amongst the the troops on the ground. So I can go on and on about her wartime exploits. You know, I could simply just not never stop talking about it. But what I will say is when her fellow resistance fighters, including Francis Camarets, had been captured by the Gestapo, they had been sentenced to death. They were going to be hung the next day. She was adamant that they'd try and help. I don't know if it was the next day. Let me say, I'm Wait. sorry. Francis Francis Camaret. That was the boyfriend that she was sleeping with. No, 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 no. This is a new. Who, who he was, he was. I just brought him up two minutes ago. Okay. He's he's the leader of the French resistance. Okay. All right. So him and a couple of their buddies get arrested at, by the Gestapo and they're sentenced to death. They're going to be Shit. killed in a couple of days. Yeah. And she's like, bro, we got to get them out of here. And the French and Polish resistance fighters are like, we can't. Like, we're not going to risk the lives of other people for just like, you know, a right, couple of guys. guys. Like, right. we're just not going to do that. And she was like, we're not, we're not just, leave. these are our friends. These are our people. We have to go. She was not a big fan of bicycles, but she got on one anyway and rode 25 miles to where they, she thought they were being held. And so it's August 15th. She circles the walls of this prison and she's humming a song called Frankie and Johnny. And it was a tune that she knew that Francis Camarets knew because they had like talked about it together. They sang it together. So she's like walking around this prison and she's humming it. And then she hears him humming the other parts of the song inside the wall. So she knows he's in there. I'm getting fucking chills. It's crazy. First of all, she didn't need training wheels. I don't, I mean, she could ride a bike, but she didn't like it. Oh, kind of like me. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, so she, she rides the bike Mm -hmm. and she's going around. She's not scared of the Gestapo. She definitely is scared. Yeah, (gasps) definitely. She takes a chance and she goes up to like a liaison officer between the Gestapo and whatever. She goes up to this officer and she's like, Francis Camarets is my husband. And I am the daughter of General Bernard Montgomery. This is like a big wig general guy for the British army. And I am part of the British resistance. She like tells this to the Gestapo. What? And she's like, you know, and I know that allied forces landed here two days ago. What you don't know is that they're right around the corner. So I'm going to let you in on a secret. If you kill my husband, who is the son-in-law of this British military military yeah. general, also not her husband, not her yeah, father. Yeah, like she's totally fucking yeah. faking it till she makes it. You personally, Gestapo guy, will be killed by the Allied troops. They're just around the corner. It's happening. 
So I'm going to let you let them go. I'm going to give you 2 million francs. And How much gonna, money is that? Like, that sounds like a lot of hot It dogs. sounds like a lot of francs. I don't know. I don't know. But you're going to take this money, and I'm going to let you let them go. And they're like, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> here, hold this gun, <laughs> and let me peace right on out of here. So in the morning, the men are marched outside, they think, to their death. Oh and my God, they're marched surprise. right out to her standing by a waiting vehicle. Oh. And she takes, she gets them out of there. Where is the movie to this story? I'm going to tell you why we don't have a movie to this story oh, okay. at the end of this. Shit. Francis Camarets would go on to name his daughter after Christina as well. Oh. So two days after she frees her friends, the Americans come and liberate the area. So she was not fucking wrong. Okay. She knew that they were close, but she did not know how fucking she close fucking they were. She fucking took a chance. Yeah. Francis and Christina met an American commander, Brigadier General Frederick B. Butler, and they offer to help. They're like, let us help. We've been in this area. We know the area. We, we know what we're doing. We're helpful. We're on your side. And, of course, the American dismisses them as bandits. I was like, get the fuck out of Wait, here. Wait, what? He's just like, get out of here. You guys aren't, you guys aren't part of the, Just go away. Yeah. She's so fucking pissed. She's, like, shaking with rage that another general, like, the general's aide has to come and be like, girl, you need to chill the fuck out. (laughs) (laughs) She's fucking pissed. The SOE teams return from France in the autumn of 1944. Some of the British women who would, like, were part of the SOE, they stayed on to go fight in the Pacific part of the war, like, against Japan. But since she was Polish, she wasn't really a British woman, they thought it would be good for her to serve as a courier for missions with her homeland. The problem was that the Red Army, the the Soviet Union, they had taken over Poland. So what, what happens at the end of the war is like the Soviet Union and America and Britain were all allies. When they went to like divide up all the countries, they didn't really do it very nicely. And that's how the Cold War sort of starts. This is such, so not like, you know what I mean? This no, is just okay, very yeah. like rudimentary. So this is like how America and Britain and the Soviet Union start to like have problems with the Soviet Union because they want to like, who's going to be in control of all this area that Germany had taken over. Right. So, so the Soviet Union takes over Poland. So since she had worked for the Brits, technically she was like, not an ally to the Soviet Union. You know what I mean? So they didn't want her in Poland. She couldn't, it wasn't safe for her to be in Poland anymore because now it was being run by the Soviets. Right. And in fact, her brother had been killed after the war from the Red Army. It becomes too dangerous for her to be in Poland and she goes to work in Britain despite all she had done to aid the allies during the war and all the awards and medals she was given after the war, which were tons of them. She didn't get the one thing she felt she most deserved, which was British citizenship, which made it impossible for her to get a job to work in the government, which is what she found most fulfilling. She wanted to like work for the British government and- continue helping rebuild and she couldn't do that because britain wouldn't give her citizenship or they kept like dragging their feet that's fucking wrong it's really fucked up she found it really difficult to like adapt back into civilian life she had to take a job as a housekeeper what a switchboard operator she worked at a harrods department store she applied for a job at the british united nations mission in switzerland but she was turned down because she's not a british citizen So in desperation, she took a job in 1951 as a stewardess on an ocean liner. Is that, wait, is that what that's called? A stewardess? Yeah, it's like, you know, someone that works just like a, like a flight attendant, but a stewardess, I guess. Julie, like on the love boat? I never saw the love boat, but yeah, probably. That was before my time. Sorry, kid. (laughs) (laughs) Another way of her calling us old. I I, I understand the concept of the show, but I, I don't know any of the characters or what they do. So the ship's captain said that all the crew members should wear their wartime medals. They're like, he's like, that wouldn't that be so great? Like, where you're, we're like so proud of being British and being whatever. So she wears her medal. She has gotten all these medals for all of the service that she'd done. The other crew members just fucking simply could not. They were like, how could a woman get these medals? These are medals for men. Did you steal them from a man <gasps> you were sleeping with? No. How could you? D- and especially the women, especially, were really cruel. They were just like, you probably just slept with a guy and he what? gave them to you. Yeah, catty bitches. Yeah. <gasps> so 
and and many of the English born men were just like, how could you possibly have more and better medals than me? Like I was like on the front lines, but she was like doing some ill shit, you know, they had metal envy. Definitely. So there was one bathroom attendant named George Maldoni and he took her side. He stood up for her and she was like so grateful because she's like, what the fuck, man? Like, I don't want to wear these medals. Like she initially when she was given the medal, she was like, I don't want to take the medals until you give me citizenship. Like she was pissed about it. Uh, but she wore the medals because her boss told her to wear them. And, right. and so she was really grateful to this guy who like stuck up for her. Unfortunately, he took her gratitude and misinterpreted that as like affection what mm. and you he, fucking creep he became obsessed with her he followed her around he stalked her and she's like bro just fucking leave me alone like ew uh, just go away so she was just like sort of floundering at this point it's like years after the war and she just like doesn't you know she's not happy so she reaches out to andrew the guy from her childhood that like she was a spy with right, and like, right. her friend that they you know he's like you know what come here come be with me like we'll find you something to do here like we'll do some cool shit over here like whatever where was he at um i believe he was in hungary okay i believe he was in budapest okay i wish i knew i'm sorry so she had a flight and the flight was it had to get canceled till the next morning due to like engine failure. Okay. So she got to spend one more night in London. So she went to dinner with some friends. Uh, she, Christina was a very passionate woman. She loved action and adrenaline. She loved men. She had husbands and many lovers over the years. But above all, this is a direct quote. She loved freedom and independence for herself for Poland, for all the allies in the face of the Nazi advances. When she was walking to her hotel after dinner with her friends, her stalker, George Maldoni, accosted her and demanded to know where she was going and how long she'd be gone. A fight ensued and he stabbed her in the heart and she died where she stood. I'm over here shaking my head because I saw where this was going and I'm like, no, 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 no. How do you survive? (laughs) How do you survive the Gestapo and then get fucking stabbed by the creepo yeah like how's how does that fucking happen she dies right where she stood what in the world he was tried and convicted for his crimes and he was sentenced to death and he was hung um she was interned in saint mary's roman catholic cemetery in northwest london after her death this is why we didn't know about her after her death andrew francis many of the other men whose lives she literally saved multiple times no say it ain't so they were determined not to let her name be dragged through the mud, quote unquote. Uh, basically, they didn't want anybody to know that she had a very healthy sex life. Oh. So they stopped two books and several press releases about her, but inadvertently concealing the amazing hero from the world. And that's why we don't know any, didn't know anything about her. Andrew died in 1988 from cancer. His ashes were buried at her foot, the foot of her grave. Oh, having never married and I guess loving her forever. Oh my God. I got chills for that. Look, look, I got chills. Oh my God. And that's the story of Christina Scarblack and, or Christina Granville, however you want to call her. Wow. I am so mad at you. (laughs) Because I saw where this was going, and I'm looking at you. <laughs> I saw You're you looking shaking. at me, <laughs> and and I knew you knew I was not going to be happy about this. No, she I, deserves so much more. She deserves so much fucking better. Just like some asshole that like thinks he's entitled to her because she was nice to him once. Yeah, you know, it's like fuck you, dude. Fuck that guy. Fuck that. He should be hung by his fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> he. <laughs> She was like a full ass war hero, Damn. like a full ass war hero. And I'm she... mad her her coworkers weren't nice to her though. I know, jealous. Yeah, they were. They were. They were fucking, definitely. They were jealous. basic bitches. Yeah, hating on a fucking queen. So, like we were saying in the middle of the story, is like these are the stories for me that I'm just like. It just like I, you know, you can't wrap your head around like mass. The whole world falling apart at the same time, right? Like, we're sort of going through that in a different way right now. But, like, the whole world fucking is dealing with Nazis and dealing with whatever. And then there's these, like, shining lights of people that are like, yeah, but I'm going to do the thing that helps. Like, how can I do something that helps? I'm good at skiing. Can I ski information across the fucking borders from country to country? Risking her own life. 
my friends are in trouble. I'm going to go and get them out of jail. Like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah. There's so many stories I, like, have on a list. You know, we both have lists of stories that we want to tell. And there's mm-hmm. just, like, I want to tell you about the Night Witches. I want to tell you about, like, there's, like, so many World War... You- Ooh, I want to know about the Night Witches. So, so do I. I. So, so do cool. I. I'm, maybe I'm going to tell it in the next couple of weeks. The book that we were trying to figure out, Beneath the Scarlet Sky, and oh. it was uh, the guy that was from Italy that was... Right. Uh, in a ski chalet yeah. and just skiing people across the border. And he that was, was a true story. He yes. was like a kid, too. Hold yeah. on, I'm going to tell you the name of the book, uh, her documentary. You'll actually really like this. There's a biography about her called The Spy Who Loved by Claire Mully. And she, I listened to her on a couple... That sounds familiar. Uh, it's, I didn't read the book because um, I only just... After I started doing research is when I found the biography, so I didn't get a chance to actually read the whole book. But... Um, So I listened to her on a couple different podcasts just talk about, like, why she decided to write a book about her and, like, whatever. And she was, like, because people would be like, oh, she was so beautiful. And she's like, yeah, it's fine that she was beautiful. But, like, I don't want to focus on that. Like, she should be remembered for, like, what the fuck she did and, like, what she put on the line. And she called it the spy who loved because, yes, she loved men and she loved to sleep with men and do things. But she also really – that quote was from her. Like, she really loved – freedom she was a passionate woman and she loved adventure and she loved so that's why she called it the spy who loved oh and i don't want to forget to mention this the guy who wrote james bond right it was rumored that they had dated for a year and a half i can't confirm or deny that that's true okay but um she is one of the main character like she, he, she is uh one of the first bond girls like he wrote about her supposedly really? supposedly but the girl who wrote the autobiography was like no 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 She's not a Bond girl. She's James fucking Bond. Yes, she yes, is. She yes. is. So I just wanted to mention that because I was like, yes, bitch, she's no Bond girl. But wait a minute. Isn't that one of the James Bond movies? It's actually The in, Spy Who Loved? There is a book. You're thinking of um, The Spy Who Shagged Me? No. No. no it's it's actually called The Spy Who Loved Me. They she they believe that she's modeled Asper, after Vesper Lind, uh, the Bond girl in Casino Royale. But... She's not. She's James Bond. The 1977 James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've never seen a James Bond movie, so I don't know anything about that. (laughs) Yeah. Not interested. (laughs) Huh. How about that? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, but she yeah, she definitely would be the James Bond Yeah, character. like, get the fuck out of here. Also, why don't we have one of those movies? Why don't we have one of those movies? Get on that. (laughs) <laughs> sure. Bring me a movie. We all know how well the uh, the changing Ghostbusters to all female cast. Yeah, were. truly. Oh my god, people lost their fucking minds. People over fucking that. hate that shit. Relax. I love it, but people hate it. Yeah. Oh well. Fuck no. those people. Who cares? So yeah, I um I have like a list of like people I'd like to talk about, and uh, yeah, it's expected to come out soon. Not soon, but it's it's what is it? a belief that oh a female the, James a Bond? female James Bond it's about freaking time is uh, oh shit they've been discussing it for a while so I don't know when that's gonna be released but it that looks interesting I I enjoyed that story I didn't like the ending though I know yeah it's actually like a tragic end to a real tale is like it's less fun yeah like ah oh, it's, it's it's like all for nothing you know what I right. mean. Well, not really for nothing because no, she accomplished. No, because she like, really right? helped a lot of but people. But what else could she have done, you know? Right. And it's kind of fucked because it's like if they would have just given her citizenship, she could have been in a job somewhere right. else and she would never even have met that fucking loser. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And how, she, how old was she when she died? Oh, that was an interesting thing because her passport said that oh, she was seven shit, years younger. Yeah. It's, they Her death certificate says that she was 37, but she wasn't. She was like 45 or something like that. Oh, shit. She was still too young. She was still way too fucking yeah. young. Yeah. Uh, wow. And this, like a couple of, you know, I, I have a couple of sources, but... Some of them were like, she was going to be with Andrew. Like, she was going to live with him, to right. marry him. They were going to get married. Aww. So it was like, it was really fucking sad, you know? <laughs> Very sad. All right. Well, listen, if you've made it this far, thanks for stopping by. Thanks <laughs> for sitting with us and sharing with us. And, well, not sharing with us, but, you know, hanging out with us. <laughs> yeah. What am I saying? What are you saying? Um, if you found us irresistible... Like how we could find you ourselves. not? Yeah. I mean, you know, that's what we think about ourselves. Um, consider subscribing to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you want to hear more, you can check our old episodes. 
when we were called Wine, Dine, and Storytime, because we have quite a few episodes for yeah. you to binge there. Don't go too far back, though, because Dana will start cringing. <laughs> Um, we also have a Patreon, so you can go check that out. We share short stories. We do document. Nope. I'm back to saying that. (laughs) We do commentary on popular documentaries and movies, and we share personal stories and videos. You can also show support by clicking on the buy me a coffee link in the show notes. And if you want, you can make a donation there. Um, but the best way to show support to tell us that you like us is to go on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere that you can give us a review and review there. Mm -hmm. Leave us a good review. It's the least you can do. That's the least you can do for this free podcast. I mean, it's the bare mins, really. (laughs) We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. We'll check you out next week. And remember, do not get taken to that second location. Be good or be good at hiding the body. Cheers. Cheers. Are you okay? This is fucking loud. <laughs> You're disgusting, and I hate you both.